Murmansk is my biggest disappointment from 2018. We're talking a seaside city beyond the Arctic Circle with easy access to Finland and Norway. I expected to see crowds of tourists, shops with fresh seafood, and bars with jolly sailors in Murmansk, but found a dull, dying city with mountains of rubbish, crumbling earth roads, and neglected old buildings. In this video, I've combined my two trips to Murmansk in 2018. I first visited in May, and then went back in November to see how the city had changed. Back then, my first trip to Murmansk didn't end without a scandal. I was scolded by locals in the comments and criticized by city officials in the media. You can compare Murmansk with another northern Russian city, Magadan, which I have a separate video about on my channel. The infrastructure is much better there. Outside of the city, though, there are some creepy ghost villages. Hey, why don't you just click on my channel, watch the Magadan video, and subscribe. This won't be my last video about the northern regions of Russia. Good morning! Finally! Look, did you notice that when we were in Finland, in Norway, it was gorgeous weather, sunshine, beauty, nature? Only when we get to Murmansk, there's rain, the gloomy leaden sky that just fell on this city. Now why is that? It's so that everyone can comment that we arrived at a bad time. Uh, we're in Murmansk! I mean, look here. They just threw together all the words that they knew that just associate with something posh and expensive in their mind. See? Wine, boutique, diplomat. No, oh, they're not cleaning the streets here. Oh, never mind. Here's a guy picking up trash from a puddle. Oh, what a beauty. Just when we started to complain. They're renovating the Rudina Cinema. It's a very cool building. I hope that it's going to be preserved in its original state, because there's always this temptation to cover it with some obscure panels, change the paint, put in plastic doors, and then, of course, the design's going to lose all its charm. But I think in this case, they're mostly going to leave it alone. Oh, this is a deserted city. Everything's going extinct. We're all alone here. Wide streets, wide pavements. All right, friends, we just had an incredible trolley bus experience, and I haven't even filmed anything, but I can tell you, while it's still fresh in my head, the first thing that struck me was the amount of advertising on that trolley bus. They're advertising waistcoats on every seat, and there's leaflets all over the place. These guys have squeezed everything they can out of the trolley bus in terms of advertising. This trolley bus system is famous for being the most northern system in the world. The southernmost used to be in Wellington, New Zealand's capital, but it was recently shut down. While in Murmansk, it's still operational. I was starting to wonder if there were tires or rubbish around. Here it is. Jesus, look. Oh, I get it. People are just throwing garbage out of their windows. You think so? Wow, look at this absolute beater. Oh, there's a local. He's going to tell us how this place got so messed up. Huh? Hello. Hello. Why is the rug lying there? Was it thrown away? Doesn't anyone want the rug? I guess it is just half a rug. <laughs> it's quite a thing going on his head there, isn't it? Oh, that? It's a hat. <laughs> really? What's his name? <laughs> My name is Ilya. Why is there trash everywhere? Because the rubbish dump was over here, now it's moved over there. About 300 feet from here, right? Well, it's not 300 feet. Well, look how much. One house, two. And that's it? People are just throwing everything out their window now, right? What did you say your name was again? No, wait, all right, this is a playground. Look, if we don't put this into our video, people aren't going to believe us. They'll say that this is like from the 90s, when really this is 2018, Murmansk. Hey, what's going on here? Why is everything so terrible? The apartment management company doesn't want to do anything for us. Doesn't matter how we contact them, doesn't matter where we call, it's always like this. Oh, do people throw trash right out the windows? You can see it's in the bags. Maybe, yeah, some people do that. They don't even clean it up. You got everything under the windows. <laughs> Then you just go right out of the house and there's a puddle right there. Why is it so... Why is it so dirty here? Dirt! 
Because the people here are dirty. This is a ghetto. Oh, I got it. Ilya, how can you be so normal here? How aren't you just cursing mad here? So they're really angry at the housing company that won't throw out trash, that doesn't do landscaping. And they just throw the trash right out of the window just to spite them. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, share it on Reddit. That's the best way to help this channel grow. Huh, it's all clean here. So there's definitely a street cleaner working here and cleaning the stairs. But if you look just behind these stairs, everything is covered in bottles of beer and vodka. On one side, there are amazing views. Honestly, the landscape here is just like in San Francisco. Also, somebody's clearly got the best office in the city. Look! You're just like the director of Murmansk. What's your opinion of this place? Well, I certainly didn't like it at first. You know, the weather, it's gloomy. But coming to the best office in the world with a gorgeous view of Murmansk port, it's really helped me to see that life is just starting here. All right, so here, by the way, you can also see the Murmansk director's car. So, as you can see, it's terrible at every turn here in Murmansk, regardless of what you're looking at. It doesn't matter if it's landscaping, houses, roads, cars. There's this kind of permanent terrible state just everywhere. But it's interesting. It's interesting to study it. I probably wouldn't want to live here, but it's interesting to explore this place. All right, so you can tell a lot about a city by its ads. And as well, it's understandable that what people eat, drink, and throw away also tell you about that city. See here, everything is littered with trash. There's an advertisement, money on the pledge of a car, money for bail, a way out of drug addiction. Hell, even getting a diploma. You see that they had beautiful nature, opportunities, like in Finland, like in Norway. But no one here wants to live in beauty. So here they took it and threw trash everywhere. The chair, the tires, the bottles, the paper. Look at this place. Look, you can't look at this and understand what people have in their heads. Explain this to me. How can you do this? How can you throw away a chair? How can you throw away bottles? And still, no one's cleaning it up. You know, of course, we can talk a lot about trash, but there's one important point. As Maxim and I are walking along the road right now, I haven't seen a single bin, not one trash can. I understand that you can't just throw trash out, and whoever's doing it is a pig. Sure, it's all wrong, but what are they meant to do? For example, there's a man that's been drinking his beer. He's uncultured, disgusting, and he wants to throw away in a trash bin, but there isn't one. There's no trash can, and no one's cleaning this up. It's a mountain of fools. That's what it's called. You want to know why? Why? You had to go down from here and there was no transport at all, basically. So you had to walk up the ramps to get to the top. The ramps are these stairs. You've probably seen them before. Yeah, we were looking at these dorms and they were such a mess. Oh, you haven't seen mess yet. Oh man, people are really throwing garbage in bags out of their windows. As a bit of background, in the Romansk region there are important strategic sites for the Russian Northern Fleet. All these sites and military bases are located in several closed cities that you can only visit with special permits. Sometimes these permits aren't even granted to all Russians, let alone foreigners. Because of its strategic importance, Murmansk itself, as well as other cities in the region, have systems of bomb shelters for the urgent evacuation of residents in an emergency situation. But where they are and their condition is still unknown. They say that this information is classified as secret. Here's the one shelter I know. I got no idea about the others. We have no information in the city where we have shelters in case anything happens. You mean in case Norway wants to come and clean up? <laughs> well, yeah, but what if a nuclear boat catches fire in Rosoyakovo like it did two years ago? We had a nuclear sub-fire in Rosoyakovo. It was fully loaded with munition. That's all. People didn't talk about it. It was just burning. It was burning and burning, and they couldn't put it out for two days. They had to flood it. This important northern region and its capital are slowly dying out. People are leaving. This is clearly visible in the census data over the years. In the early 1990s, Murmansk had more than 450,000 inhabitants. By 2006, that number had dropped to 321,000. And in 2016, the city had just over 300,000 people. 
The situation is the same for other cities. From 1989 to 2013, the population of the entire Murmansk Oblast decreased by 36.5%. The outflow of the population started after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when the country was in the throes of a serious economic crisis. Many regions became impoverished at once, industries closed down, construction stopped, and the authorities stopped allocating funding. The same thing happened to the Murmansk Oblast. You really have to look at the parts where people live and see the conditions they live in. And the working class, as a matter of fact, lives here. An antenna? Yeah, they have their television switched off, but they don't care. They don't pay it, so they got their TV shut off? Yes, look, people live here. Here, you see, the windows are boarded up, but people live there. That's amazing. Yep, they're plugging back in the TV. You know what the best part is? There's the stadium and there's the school. There's a school over there. So wherever there are boarded up windows, people live there too? Well, yeah, somebody probably lives there. There's a playground. That's convenient. You can roll right under the car bumper. People don't have a fridge, so they hang their food out the window. What a mess. Since 2017, the federal authorities have taken on the task of improving public spaces in cities. The truth, though, as it turns out, they don't know how to create a comfortable urban environment. Now I just want to show you this miserable playground that they've built here in Vermont. The United Russia Party made this comfortable area on Marinova Street, and they brought up the equipment here, and they dug out what was there, soil, whatever. And they just dumped it here. Yeah, they dumped it here. There, you see? And it's all like this here. All right, isn't there a better place to walk through? I just don't want to kill my trainers. No, I'm not sure. Come on, come on, I'll show you. I walk my dog here every day. No, 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 hold on, hold on. Yeah, man, look, I got new trainers on. They're gonna get destroyed in no time. <laughs> you Muscovites are just so fragile. Imagine going to an outhouse here on a winter night. One man did that and died. So you see people just throw all their trash out of the windows, and that's it. Everything's trashed. There's garbage all over the yard. There's some birds and rats eating everything up. It's all just waste. It stinks. People live here. See? There's a vegetable garden, a jack straw. There's actually an outdoor wooden toilet. And here's my favorite place to go for a walk, here where the gravel is. And that's where this comfortable urban area starts, the project of Murmansk United Russia. They were very happy. They directly reported that they had built everything here and they finished the project in autumn. You see, they put up new streetlights. If you go to the playground, look at how they cemented it in winter and poured cement into the snow. It was done really badly. Just look at what was left there. This is decent. What's considered a decent house? I mean, decent people live here who more or less pay their rent and bills. The authorities then... Oh, wait. So a decent person, just someone that pays their bills, that's a decent person? Yeah, yeah. To the authorities, it's already a decent person. Look, this is a comfortable urban environment. This is what they've done. This is what they've invested in. It's just terrible. So this playground was built under our beloved program to create a comfortable urban environment, which the Ministry of Construction promoted across the country. It's here where these clowns with flags of United Russia opened and tried to give the residents happiness. Here, happiness has come out in the form of this miserable playground. And they haven't finished it, as I understand it. Uh, they're not going to do anything else here? No, that's it. The happiness is here. I mean, just look at this. Look at this quality. They put everything into the mud, into the snow. The snow melted. Now all these concrete bases they drove into the fence are poking out. We really have such beautiful places in a beautiful city. Well really beautiful city when it's light gray, pearly, and sunny. You know, you look at it at four o'clock in the afternoon or morning on a polar day, it's very beautiful. But we live here. We live in a world of smashed windows and nobody wants us at all because those who have funding and power to fix something, they start saying that it's our fault because we don't pay utility bills, because we don't know who owns these houses. We don't know what management companies here, you know? Then comes a comfortable environment program for United Russia and they say, what do you want? We made this comfortable place for you. We completed our project. And then they come out and say, we spent money on this city. We made it comfortable for them. And that's what outrages me most. Maybe we really did come here during bad weather, but I don't remember seeing this much trash anywhere, at least not this much. See, separate trash collection is practiced here too. See, this is where they collect life buoys and chairs. Over here, they collect mattresses and furniture. And here, it's glass and plastic. 
Murmansk is in a unique location on a peninsula above the Arctic Circle, next to the Barents Sea Bay, which separates the region from the Arctic Ocean. I thought that because of its location, the region had a well-developed fishing industry, and all of Murmansk's residents could eat cheap fish and seafood. Imagine my disappointment when I found out it costs as much here as it does in parts of Russia that are further from the ocean. It turned out that the fishing industry was slowly dying here. The authorities are tightening fishing operation laws and preventing fishing in the border zones. At the same time, no one's developing the port infrastructure. There are no normal fish processing enterprises or workshops for repairing ships. Even Russian fishing vessels don't stop at the port of Murmansk. Because of high customs duties and complicated inspections, it's more profitable for them to go to the neighboring port of Norway, the border with which is only a few hundred miles away. So why is there no fish? Uh, well, uh, fresh salmon. From Norway. We have sanctions on salmon. What kind of fish? We tried to grow something here last year, but they threw away dozens of tons. Something didn't work. There was some kind of disease or something like that. So it turns out that Russian fishermen catch fish in Norway, right? Well, the seas have this thing. I get you. They catch fish and give it to the Norwegians. Yeah, and they come here empty? They don't come here just because they don't go to this port as a rule. They don't come here because they're not cleared. There are practically no Russian steamships here now. There are very few of them left. Now all the steamships are foreign. So everyone just works for Norway? That's why everybody works for Norway, including Norwegian supply, water, spare parts. Everything is from there with few exceptions. And they create the most favorable conditions for fishermen there, as much as possible anyway. You know, recently, our steamship went to Murmansk. We were driven to Murmansk at the end. Again, it was just absurd, which one more time proves that everything isn't right here. Just think about it. A steamship goes to port and nobody's happy. Nobody from the first sailor to the captain. Nobody's rejoicing because that steamship, after its whole voyage, they're going home to her port, her home port of Murmansk. This is the oldest part of town, right? The oldest. Yeah, the oldest. The oldest district of the city. No, it's beautiful. I'm trying to find something good. Somebody picked out some unusual colors. Yeah, the yellow and purple go together. Yeah, this is a bit of a paradox, by the way. You know, you look at houses in Norway, and they're amazingly good at matching colors. They have reds, they have greens, they have roofs. In Norway, I think the houses are mainly red. Yeah! Look, if you take away the yellow and the purple and the lilac, it would look great with white and gray, right? Yeah. White with gray. Yeah. There's a light gray there, too. Yeah, but here, when we're choosing colors, we try to make sure they clash as much as possible. This is social housing, houses for people displaced out of, like, rotting wooden houses. So we have to go through some rubble. Now they'll say in the comments that we were looking for it on purpose. And now we can see who brought us here, everyone. You can see what people are doing here on the playground. Drinking beer and playing princess. As well, you can clearly see how the architecture degrades over time. Look, these are early Soviet buildings. There are some balusters, some balconies, some arches, entrances made. And here is the new housing. Just primitive boxes without details and without soul. Look, it's an adventure. You have to hop over those tires to get to the door. So we came to the house where the governor of the Murmansk region lives. The house isn't bad. Nice balconies, it's insulated. One would like to believe that there's no trash here. But no, no trash dumping. But there's high-end trash. First of all, it's in bags, mind you. LG. LG boxes, yeah. Someone's thrown out an expensive wardrobe. There's high-end trash here. Governor's trash. Look, there's expensive kettles. LG Hoover. This is where the governor lives. It's still trashed. All right, Maxim. What do you think of Murmansk? What are your impressions? Oh, terrible city. I didn't expect this. I thought it was a big northern polar city. So you've not seen anything like this. You know, it's not a small town. It's a big city. You know, there's a port here. There's some money. And that was the end of my first trip to Murmansk. Almost immediately after that video was published, I was bombarded with a barrage of angry comments. Murmansk's ruins were defended by ordinary citizens and officials alike. A local television channel even released a news report in response to my posts and the video. 
where the mayor explained why Mermont's had so much trash. Now, I went back there six months after the first video was published to see what had changed. And spoiler, not much. Friends, we came to Murmansk, and not just to Murmansk, but quite by accident, I ended up in the same area where I'd been the last time. For however big Murmansk is on the map, I was looking all over, looking for some nice streets and houses set up. I thought there'd be something interesting, but I ended up in this neighborhood. I don't remember its name. There are two three-story houses here from Stalin's day. There are also some very decrepit and rotten wooden houses there. And here they're doing reconstruction. Those are new houses. They're demolishing the wooden houses, and these ones are being built in their place. Now, they're relocating people to these three story houses. Last time I was here, I was really taken aback by how much trash there was, and I was figuring that since they had time, maybe they had the chance to get it cleaned up. Now see, obviously, we got to Murmansk at a bad time. Uh, they've had snow here not long ago, and then it stops snowing and everything is melting. That's why there's mud everywhere. This is probably one of the worst areas in Murmansk. There are still wooden buildings. They're slowly being demolished and they're in terrible condition, of course. But it's a pity that in Russia, all these kinds of wooden houses are so decrepit that it's just easier to just tear them down than it is to even try and repair them. But if we look in Scandinavian countries like Norway or Finland, their wooden houses of the same age are in good condition. They're looked after, they're cared for, and now they have quite comfortable housing. But here it's just a mess. There have never been roads here, so they're not cleaning the snow off or nothing like that. You know, it's very beautiful on its own. That's what's good about Murmansk. It's beautiful scenery. And what's even better is that there are children running around on hills, crows and hungry dogs running between garbage dumps. Oh, don't you just want to die in this place? We're in Murmansk, and I was hoping that the dumpsters were cleaned out, but they weren't. They didn't empty them, and they're not going to empty them. All right, now, come on, that's it. Boom, good job. Why don't they take out the trash here? because you don't have to, because there's no people here. Do you live here? Where? Yeah, I live in the 27th house right there. You're not, wait, you don't live here. We don't even see you. I live in this house. You don't live here. What do you mean not here? I'm saying these people are spying on us now. I just noticed. Oh, we're not spying, don't say that. Oh, for God's sakes, let them spy. At least I'll get a chance to tell them something. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm saying that. So these houses were supposed to come down by a specific date? The federal program's over. Well, tell me about it. It was going on for five years, this federal program. The program ended in 2017, and the demolition of wooden houses ended then, too. So there shouldn't be any more of these wooden houses. Your 27th house shouldn't be here now. But it's still standing. How long do you think it's going to be standing? Well, I'm hoping I'll live long enough to see it demolished. But it's all the slum dwelling getting demolished, right? Yeah. And it's being replaced with new houses? Well, I reckon they'll last another 15, 20 years for sure. I think so. How old is your house? Number 27? Oh, this house is from 1948. My husband's from 1948, and so is this house. Is it a good thing that they're tearing down all these houses? I don't know. I lived in one back when I was four. Are the new houses good? The colored ones? No, of course not. Why not? I can't even tell you. Why not? Tell me. Really? It's because they're falling apart. They're not even built on foundations that are settled. You know, I'm a builder from the future. Sorry, I mean in the past. The foundations don't settle, but they still build on them, and then they decay. Then they crack, and everything comes off. You know, people are driving Jeeps and living in these wooden houses. I'm thinking, why? It is very difficult to walk here because there's ice everywhere, and everything is very slippery. I don't know how people walk here. Now we're gonna see how this boy climbs an icy mountain. Hey there. Hello. You all right? You slipping? Oh, I'm slipping. Now, but you know what you're doing, right? Yeah, I do. Hey, don't fall. The boy's clearly on winter tires. He's digging his nails through his boots into the ice, clinging onto it. Oh, let's hurry and get in the car. It's warm in the car. The houses have already gone into the dirt. There are some windows lit up. We drove out of that neighborhood and now we found some streets with burnt and ruined wooden houses. I think this is the worst area. The most terrible district in Murmansk. By the way, they're all empty. It's even kind of scary here.
There's just a whole abandoned district here. Yeah, this one just burned down today. It's still burning. They're not even putting the fire out. No one cares that it's on fire. No one's putting it out. An abandoned house burns down, it'll be easier to tear it down. It's like a horror movie. Yeah, like a ready-made set. The thing is, they keep burning. Or trash is burning, I don't know what. They're already burnt out here, but they're still burning. I think they're just burning them now. Where's the fire department? It's not supposed to be like that. Very creepy in Murmansk now, because of the bad weather and the grey skies, there's twilight practically the whole day. And you go and here are these abandoned houses, all two-story, burnt. It's just a nightmare. I want to have time today to see the places that I looked at last time. I started with that yard where the residents were throwing trash right out of the windows. Look, they got a problem with large trash for some reason. It's all over the place, and obviously it's not getting picked up. Looks like it's been dumped. What's it doing here? Does anybody need a car? Just come to Murmansk. They got extra ones here. It's gone! The road's a mess, but that's understandable. But the trash has been cleared away. It used to be all blocked up here. They've prepared. They've prepared for my arrival. Look, there's trash on the visor. There used to be trash all over the place, but now there's no trash. So there you go. You see? The power of blogging. It was worth writing, and Ramonks became cleaner. And you ask, why are you doing all this? It's to make the authorities work. Damn it, but they didn't get here. It's actually cleaner. I mean, it used to be really creepy here, but it's cleaner now. Which, it can't help but make you happy. Something's gotta make us happy. There's still that fridge door, though. Yeah, it's a memento. I don't think they've noticed it. We should put some flags here for it. Okay, you know, it actually is cleaner. It used to be really creepy here. I'll be honest though, these landscapes, these shabby houses, this broken road, the ice, the streams flowing that no one's cleaning, this kind of steam that comes from people's breath, it's so raw. The mist, the pink sky, you know, it's dawn now. And it's very beautiful, really. Right here in Murmansk, we can make horror films. See, that's your most terrible shot right there. Silent Hill or something like that. You see, you block out this whole shot here, put some creepy music on it, and that's it. Something terrible is bound to happen here. It's dark everywhere. We wrote to the prosecutor's office, wrote to the Ministry of Emergency Situations, and to the governor. Nothing's done. Where'd you guys say you were from again? Oh, we're from Moscow. Oh, Moscow. They've already written something about our city. Yeah, I, I did that. Oh, you did? Yeah, that was me in the spring. I came here to see what's changed. Nothing's changed. Oh, man, and you were all hopeful. Yeah, it's just that they promised to clean it up back then, so I thought I'd check out to see if they kept their promises. They got some furniture, some sofas, they've taken them out, but they're dumping them here again. They're doing renovations there and nothing's getting cleaned. Yeah, I gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, keep spreading the word. We're gonna complain and write too. You have a good day. All right, goodbye. All right, so you see, people are saying nothing's changed. See, I'm an optimist. I wanted to believe in the good. I thought that in Murmansk, everything was a little bit better, but no, it hasn't changed. Now what can I say? The locals have dashed all my hopes. Now I got a bag with trash. Where am I gonna take it? Oh, I'll just throw it out on the pavement. That came from a window too. I mean, it really was just thrown out of the window. You know, walking around here, I'm afraid something's gonna fall on my head. And this is how they walk in Murmansk. And this is probably the most beautiful, illegal parking lot you've ever seen. Look at the views. Here's a parking lot and the view of a city from here. All the hills are drowned in clouds. 
Rock was incredible weather today. One minute it's sunny and the whole sky is pink. The next it's foggy and the whole road is icy. And in this fog, people walk, cars drive here. It's beautiful, it really is, but I don't want to live here. Not in this mess. Notice they got tires all over the place. You know, this is some kind of global problem. Garbage. The city is just full of tires and bottles. I mean, everywhere you look, there's trash. No one takes it away, no one recycles it. It's obvious that people don't want to pay for taking the trash out and just throwing it here. So it's like that everywhere. It shouldn't be like this, though. They have to deal with these issues somehow. During my second trip, I didn't just see city infrastructure. I also saw local entertainment. So now I'm going to show you a touristy Murmansk, a Northern Lights observation, and a tour of the world's first nuclear-powered icebreaker. All right, so we have the most important moment of our trip. We're finally going to see the Northern Lights. I've never seen the Northern Lights in my life, but I've read a lot about them. Now, first of all, I know for sure that if you conceive a child under the Northern Lights, it'll be a boy. That's why a lot of Chinese people come to Murmansk and Norway. We had an unbelievable amount of Chinese people checking into our hotel today. Now, how do you find the Northern Lights? You need a good guide for that. And we have Alexei in the car with us today. Alexei is a guide. He's someone who can find the Northern Lights even under the cloudy Murmansk sky. And now it's, well, it rained all day long. There were low clouds and the whole sky was covered by them and there was no hint of light. Are we going to find the lights? We'll try. When should you watch the lights? You have to watch the Northern Lights from September to April when it's dark. Because the rest of the time, it's sunny at night in the north. If you can imagine. When the sky is clear every day, you can see the Northern Lights at a different intensity. So, it may be faint, it may appear for 30 seconds, it may shine for a couple of hours. So, in theory, if the sky was clear, you could see the northern lights every day. Yes, but it's better to travel outside the city so the city lights don't get in the way. So, you've seen the northern lights? Of course. And you, Lyuba? Me? No. Masha? Vasya? I saw them yesterday, yeah, for the first time. First time in my life. Yesterday you saw the Northern Lights. Yeah, yeah. What was it like seeing it for the first time? You feel shock. You can't move for like the first 10 seconds. You run a red light and you can't understand anything. <laughs> I was kidding, I was kidding, Ilya. All right, so really, what does it feel like to see the Northern Lights? Well, first of all, it's amazing. For the first five, 10 seconds, I just stood there and watched this green thing moving. Something happened to it, and then I took a camera and started to take photos of it. You know, in general, Murmansk is the best place outside the Arctic Circle. The tallest building, the longest road bridge, the tallest monument, trolley buses go here. This is the northernmost city. All right, we've arrived at a new location. There seem to be cars parked here. It looks like there are little glimpses in the sky and I'm trying to take pictures of it. I can't see anything with my eyes, but with a slow shutter speed, the pictures seem to have green specks in the sky. It's almost some sort of light. It's a strange thing, this northern lights thing. No idea how it would have been seen without a camera before. It's already appeared a little bit behind the clouds, so we're just waiting for it to get brighter. What's the best time to watch them? Generally, with very good sunshine. Somewhere between 7 at night and 3 in the morning. Uh, I mean, I hope we're not waiting after 3, because it's really freezing. No, no, not that late. Oh, thank you, thank you. How do you make the stars appear? What do you do to see the stars in Murmansk? Well, we watch the forecast. <laughs> Just that simple? <laughs> oh, I mean, you could have lied to me, said something exciting. So, what's so special about the Northern Lights? First off, it's cold. Second, you can't see anything yourself, you're just filming. And then you have a shutter speed of 30 seconds, 30 seconds later, something appears on your camera screen and you're like, oh, that's beautiful. And you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to Photoshop these pictures and it's going to be bright, super bright, and everyone's going to be amazed. Wow, that's a real thing. It's really just a black sky with stars, and you can't see it without a camera. But there are brighter ones, right? Where's our specialist? Sometimes it's so bright that even the earth shines. <laughs> Tell me, please, how are the lights experts staying warm? Oh, with tea. <laughs> okay, so after the tea, that's when the earth lights up? 
After the northern tea, yeah. All right, how much would it cost me to see the lights again with tea? About $85. Is that with tea? Yeah. The next day, I went on a tour of the nuclear-powered icebreaker Lenin. This enormous thing was built from 1956 to 1959 by about 500 Soviet enterprises. With the help of the atomic icebreaker, the Soviet Union studied the Arctic and navigated its maritime routes. Here is the icebreaker Lenin. There are guided tours of the interior. We're going to go on one to see what it's like inside. There's an $8 door fee, and you can take photos and videos for free. The tour is in Russian and English, which is convenient for tourists, and it costs a total of 25 bucks. Let's start with the main room. From here, the whole pulse of the icebreaker's life is set. It was a mess hall that was a traditional center for ship life. Household problems were settled here, the crew was fed, social issues were resolved, and guests were invited. You see that we've had some of the most famous, distinguished guests here. Gagarin was here, a young Fidel Castro. Yeah, Fidel Castro. This is from his first visit to the Soviet Union in 1963. And the icebreaker still functions, right? No, it doesn't. In 1989, the operation of the icebreaker was ended. First of all, what sets it apart is the abundance of wood. In this sense, it is a unique vessel in the Russian Navy. The Soviet government regarded the icebreaker not only as technological progress, but also as a statement in big politics, and the task was defined as follows. The world's first nuclear icebreaker should become a new symbol of the state. Over all these years, there has not been a single architectural reconstruction or restoration. All in all, everything is preserved in its original form. It's not easy. I should say that the icebreakers go to the pole quite often. Now, as I was saying about Kuchiev, he was the first to bring the Arctica icebreaker to the pole. That was on August 17, 1977. Since then, the nuclear-powered icebreakers have been to the pole 117 times and the rest of the world's icebreakers have visited the North Pole only 11 times. These are mainly tourist cruises. They've been taking place for 28 years, since 1990, and they're still very popular. That is, they're sold out in no time. How much is a ticket? That voyage is going to cost each tourist more or less $30,000. So say I'm very rich. I can just rent the entire icebreaker to myself and hold a wedding? Yeah, no problem. How much does it cost to rent an icebreaker? Well, I can't give you exact figures. Well, what's an estimate? It's about $60,000 to $70,000 a day. Oh, so it's very inexpensive, or expensive, I mean. Well, it's not cheap. It's about 70000 a day. And how long does it take to get to the North Pole and back? 12 days. Now, if you'd like, you can go up those metal steps, look inside. It's the same whether it's one window or the other. And this is the reactor, right? Yeah, that's the view from the top of the reactors. It's not a very good view, of course, but everything's basically below deck there. Well, the main element inside the reactor, the nuclear fuel, it's a mock-up, but it's life-size. It's called a fuel assembly, and there are 482 of them in nuclear reactors like this one. This amount of nuclear fuel is enough for the icebreaker to operate for about four to six years. To put it into perspective, if you were to go to the Arctic, an icebreaker takes about 5,000 tons of liquid fuel. That's roughly a third of its weight. That's enough for a month and a half. So this is the canteen? Yes. A third of the crew, or as it is fashionable to say now, officers, command staff, they were fed here in this mess room. Others, plus secondary people, there were quite a lot of them, especially in the first year of icebreaker operation. They were fed here. There are 85 seats, but in the first years, there were so many people on board that we had to organize meals in three groups. And there are four meals a day in the fleet. That's 12 shifts a day. Can you imagine how fun that was? Like a food conveyor from morning until night. But in spite of that, in the evenings, the dining hall was turned into a movie theater. As you can see, Here's a screen and a projector, and everything was preserved in its original state. There are photos that show different episodes. There weren't any live entertainers on the icebreaker, that's why we use movies. So were there women on the icebreaker? Yeah, up to a fifth of the crew. Oh, so everything was okay. Yeah, it was fine. So this room here is called the Power and Survivability Post. It's the center for control and monitoring all the icebreaker's propulsion systems. This is where the crew was regularly manned around the clock. Two operators, that is, two nuclear reactors and two operators, each in charge of his or her own reactor. 
Here sat the operator responsible for the electric propulsion systems. The Americans were actually building their first and only nuclear powered ship at the same time as us. It was called Savannah, and it was a cargo passenger vessel. And to win this competition against the U.S., something was taken from the first nuclear submarine to save cost and time to speed up the construction of the Lenin icebreaker. We put this entire module, and its controls were taken from the nuclear submarine and built in. There's a bit more space here. Of course, it was more cramped in the submarine. You see, everything turned out quite well. We saved some money. Let's have a look from the past to the present day. This is the second museum on board the icebreaker. It was open about three years ago. Now, with the help of computer technology, you can imagine the Arctic in a virtual form. Oh, man, it is warm here. Yes, it is warm. A heater was installed. Do these windows open? Yes. There are these fasteners that hold the glass firmly in place. Sometimes you can tear them off so that the windows will open. But it's better not to do that. They're very heavy windows. It takes two people to lift it back up. The glass is designed for the force of the shock wave from an atomic explosion of these reactors. It's very strong glass. And there was a case when the iceberg was hit by such a shock wave. That was in 1961. In 1961, there were the polar explorers that landed on the ice flow of the North Pole 10 station. And after that, they conducted this test, the so-called Kuzma's mother. Nikita Khrushchev did it. There was this explosion, and the nuclear-powered icebreaker Lenin was relatively close by. But the windows didn't crack. So this is what we call the captain's bridge, the wheelhouse, the navigator's cabin, the radio room. So this is how it works. The icebreaker is controlled from here. The wheel changes the ship's course. What's hard about that? What's hard isn't changing the course. The difficulty is keeping the ship on course, because unlike humans, a ship doesn't live according to orders or commands. Ships live according to the laws of physics. Such a huge metal construct weighing around 20,000 tons has a high degree of inertia. Then the task of the helmsman is to extinguish the unnecessary inertia with the helm and maintain the set course. And the second level of icebreaker control is these knobs here. Now what are they for? It gives the icebreaker a very valuable quality, maneuverability. Maneuverability is the basis of navigational safety. And by that I mean it's so important to maneuver correctly in the Arctic ice that if you don't move at exactly the right time or if you move incorrectly, it may end very badly for you. You may even lose a vessel, which would get crushed by ice, as the main threat when navigating in ice is ice compression. To begin with, these winds break the ice cover and millions of tons of ice are set in motion. This is very dangerous. So you have to do something to avoid this ice compression. There's only one way, maneuvering. That is, if you change direction by maneuvering, the ice compression will stop. It only affects the channel made by the icebreaker at a strictly defined angle. But the thing is that in five to 10 minutes, the wind will blow from the other side and the compression might occur again. And another maneuver will be necessary. And why does the icebreaker do all this? because an icebreaker is designed so that ice compression doesn't have these terrible consequences. Why? The icebreaker's hull is so rounded that as soon as it starts to shrink, the ice pushes it out. It rises above the ice mass and then breaks it by applying pressure to it. So, strictly speaking, the very name of the icebreaker isn't quite correct. The icebreaker isn't breaking the ice, it's crushing it. Radio services played a very important role at that time, but now there is no radio service on icebreakers. And so the beautiful romantic profession of the radio operator, well, it died in the fleet. You see how much equipment was here and how many people were here. There were eight in total on the radio service. Here, all these huge boxes, these chests, all this was replaced by the computer. Tell me, was there any alcohol on the icebreaker? Be honest. Not officially, so you can tell the truth now. It doesn't have to do with telling the truth or lying. It wasn't official. Everybody says at one time or another as an argument that on all types of submarines, operators were given this dry wine, a glass of seven ounces a day. Now you have to be specific with that amount. They were very careful when they gave it to people because they were dealing with radiation. 
so for fun. Yes, to relieve, for example, psychological stress. Did they give it to you? We didn't get it. But did you have it? I'll put it this way. Everyone solved their own problems their own way. This is one of the five rooms in the captain's cabin. The captain's cabin, as you see, was large. The saloon. The saloon, yes. This was where the captain held meetings during his voyage and hosted guests when he came to port. There were a lot of guests, of course. That is why everything is so beautiful here. It's a very impressive atmosphere. Well, that was great. Thank you so much, everyone. Come and visit us again. Thank you very much. Thank you for the tour. It was very interesting. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Unfortunately, apart from the icebreaker and its very interesting guide, I didn't see anything good in Murmansk. The saddest thing is that there's no reason for the extinction of this region. There are a lot of useful resources here. Now there's a possibility to develop tourism due to the unusual nature of the far north and its proximity to two Scandinavian countries. I just hope somebody develops it soon. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button and let us know in the comments if you like these old videos. And while you're here, do us a favor. Share the video on Reddit so as many people as possible can see it.